just so wonderful to be here with you. I got a word from God today. And in fact, I want to just, I want to move right into it. I want you to turn in your word to Genesis chapter 15. If you have a difficult time finding Genesis, meet me after service and we'll, we'll pray for you. Genesis chapter 15, we're going to read quite a few verses therein that will establish the thought that I have for today. We're going to read Genesis chapter 15 verses 1 through 11 and then we'll jump down to verse 17 and read 17 and 18. It says, After these things the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. In other, in other words, uh, I'm struggling because you made some promises to me. And one of the promises that you made is that I was going to have a child. And... Uh, I don't see no child and, and, I, and I understand that in order for me to have legacy the child has to be born in my house and the only one that's in my house to carry on my legacy is my servant Eliezer I'm struggling with this and then Abraham said look you've given me no offspring indeed one born in my house is my heir verse 4 it says and behold the word of the Lord came to him saying this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. I want to point out something really quickly. In the first verse it says that the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. In a vision, right? God shows up in a vision. He gives him a vision and he says, don't be afraid. In other words, he is tapping into where Abram is in that moment. Because it is impossible to be afraid and be trusting God at the same time. So God comes in and he immediately scans Abram's spiritual and emotional state and in a vision comes to him and says, don't be afraid. So the first time he, he speaks to him in a vision, says, don't be afraid. When Abraham, Abram begins to question God, he begins to express his concern about, about his heir, about the promise being fulfilled. In verse 4 it says, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. So this was not in a vision, this was in his, his inner man. God speaks to us in our inside. He speaks to us by the Spirit. So one time he spoke to him, it was by vision. The other time it was by Spirit. Does that make sense? It's going to make more sense in a second. He reveals himself as the word comes to him in spirit first, or in, in vision first, and then spirit. It, 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 it makes sense. I just want to, we got a lot of ground to cover. And then in verse 5 it says, after he tells him, no, 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 Eliezer is not going to be the heir, but the one that comes out of you will be your heir. And then in verse 5 it says, then he brought him outside. God takes Abram outside. And he says, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. What God is doing in that moment is God is showing him God's ability. He takes him outside, shows him the stars. He says, you're struggling because you're only seeing it according to your ability. Let me take you outside. God says, let me take you outside and show you what I do for a living. You see those stars out there? You see those galaxies? You see that solar system? Uh... That's me, bruh. That, that's, I do that in my sleep. And so if I do that in my sleep, I can do effortlessly this thing that I'm promising you. Are we tracking together? Okay. And so in verse 6 it says, Abraham believed in the Lord and he, God, accounted to him for righteous. That word believe uh, speaks to the idea of foundation. He, he was settled. He was settled. Because whenever you're not trusting, you're unsettled. Uh, we got to get through this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 
up to my old tricks again. I'm supposed to be reading this and I end up teaching it. I'm sorry. Okay. So, and he believed in the Lord and he, God, accounted it to him, Abram, for righteousness. Verse 7, it says, Then he, God, said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. So now we're moving into a different promise. One promise was a child. Second promise was a nation, the descendants of the child. Now he's saying that I'm going to give you a land. This is important, right? And, and, and I'm not going to, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans, and I'm going to give you this land. In other words, I didn't bring you out for nothing. I would not disrupt your life. I would not disrupt your situation and leave you. I feel the spirit of God. I wouldn't cause you to hope into, into something and then not come through on my word and come through on the promise that I made to you. Are you tracking with me? You got to understand that. He's saying, I am the one that brought you out. That was me. And I am the one that's going to bring you in. Are you tracking with me? That's somebody's word this morning. I am the one. Come on, L.A. I am the one who brought you from your mother's house and brought you into L.A. And I'm going to bring you into everything I promised you. Ah. Just turn to your neighbor and say, God's not going to leave you hanging. Verse 7, he says, I'm the Lord who brought you out of, the, out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land inherited. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he believed on one level, but there was still another level of belief that he needed. Abram says, how shall I know it? How shall I know it? And then in verse 9, God says to him, he doesn't answer in the way that one would think he would answer. He says, I'm about to show you how. You're going to know. He says, how shall I know? Isn't that everyone's question? God, how can I know that what you promised me is going to happen? Anybody ever been there? I believe you, but I'm struggling with knowing. There's a difference between believing and knowing. Mm. Today's going to be good. It's going to be good. He says, how shall I know that I will inherit it? Verse 9, so God said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, and a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Somebody said, after I said turtle dove, you thought I was going to say, and a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> and then he brought all these things to him and cut them in two down the middle and place each piece opposite the other but he did not cut the birds in two you know why he didn't cut the birds in two as they're bringing me a towel from a sweat you know why he didn't cut the birds in two he didn't cut the birds in two because you weren't supposed to cut the birds in two hello somebody I was wondering, I'll be honest with you, I was wondering, like, why didn't he cut the birds in two? He cut everything else in two. Why didn't he cut the birds in two? And I, I called my father-in-law last night. I said, Bishop Jake, you got to tell me if anybody knows. It's Bishop Jake. I said, Bishop Jake, why didn't he cut the birds in two? And we, we looked through it and we searched the scriptures and everything. He's like, oh, no, they, they didn't do that. You weren't supposed to do that. I'm like, oh, I thought it was some deep thing. It wasn't a deep thing. So in case you were wondering, you got re get, getting ready to go into a deep thing. Gracias, Señor. Getting ready to go into a deep thing, just know it's not deep. They, they didn't cut the turtle dove and the pigeons because that was... Uh, not what they're supposed to do. That was a good distraction, wasn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Verse 10, it says, Then he brought all these things to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite each other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Just a caveat, anytime God's getting ready to show you something that will bring you into another dimension of your calling, there will always be vultures that come down on the very thing to try to disrupt what God is getting ready to do. And so you got to learn how to be like, I feel the Holy Spirit of God. You got to learn how to be like Abram and just shoo him away. Just, just shoo every negative thought away. Just, just shoo every negative situation away. Just, just shoo it. God's getting ready to do something. Shoo. Just say, shoo. I feel this. If you're going to walk in 
into everything that God has called you to be. God, I feel that for some of you. God leads you down a road. He leads you into something. He's leading you into something, and you're this close to it, and all of a sudden, vultures come. Ravenous birds, scavengers come to distract you, but I love it. It's like being in the car and there's a gnat in the car and you're trying to go somewhere, you're on somewhere, and then you end up sw swinging at gnats. When the gnat can't hurt you, gnats aren't even poisonous, they can't get in your, they, they can't do nothing to you, but you end up almost crashing your car. Swing at things that don't matter. I got to get through this. We gotta, I got I to get through this. I'm supposed to be reading. I'm supposed to be reading. I'm supposed to be reading. When the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Verse 17, it says, and it came to pass. We jumped down to 17. It says, and it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between the, those pieces. And on the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. I want to talk from this theme today, the gift of confidence. The gift of confidence. Father, thank you so much for this moment that you've allowed us to step into today. Lord, you're doing something. We feel it. We sense it. And we know it. You're equipping us. You're preparing us for this decade. Hallelujah. You've got so much in store for your sons and daughters, but we're going to have to become in order to lay hold of it. And so, Father, in this this moment that we have together, these few moments that we'll spend together, we pray that your spirit would descend down upon us in a rich and powerful way, God, that this would become a house of transformation to the effect that, that our minds would be renewed, that we might be aligned with what you're doing in our lives. And Father, I pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and insight and knowledge, Lord God, full access to the gifts of the Holy Spirit full access to heaven's resources god to bring to pass truths that that enlighten us that empower us that equip us that that cause us to be aligned with the highest identity in you that we might be in there if you called us to be and father while we're praying we're praying for the person who's next to us will you bless them real good please we don't know exactly what need they may have spiritually physically emotionally or otherwise but God, we ask whatever that need is that you would meet it. And ultimately, God, get the glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Do me a favor. Before you take your seat, just greet somebody. Just greet somebody. Say, I'm glad you're here. Happy New Year. Do something like that. Hallelujah. God bless you. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. The gift of confidence. This, this time of the year, in the beginning of a year, certainly in the beginning of a decade, there's always a surge in confidence. The new year usually, generally brings with, that, brings with it a spirit of optimism and renewed enthusiasm. You're back in the gym. Your looks are improving. You're... Your vision is clear, and, and, and usually, typically, you and I are more confident about the year that's ahead. That's just how it goes. So, so there's always a surge in confidence, and, and the confidence that I'm describing is self-confidence, and self-confidence is awesome. Like, it's, in fact, most psychologists would agree that if you are self-confident, it gives you an edge in life. You know what I'm saying? When you're self-confident, you, you move forward with, because you don't have the trepidation that, that, that comes into play when you don't have confidence. When you're, when you're self-confident, you, you, you have an edge because you, you jump into things and you, you jump into tasks and feats with just the sense that I can do it. And, uh, and, and, and when you're more confident about something, you know, the greater your chances are of actually achieving those things and excelling those things because you believe you can do it. Self-confidence is absolutely incredible. And, and you could even grow your self-confidence. Uh, in fact, if you want to grow your self-confidence, one of the ways you can do it is you can, you know, you can go back to school, you can enhance yourself in, in, in some of your skills and, and your experiences in the area, in certain areas that'll make you more confident. Uh, like for me, to be honest with you, like working out, I, I get confident when I work out. 
When I got that thing going right here, that little, you know what I mean? That, 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 that you know, if you can see it, that, 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 uh, that 400 pack, I'm not confident. So for me, like working out, I get more confident. When I, when I work out, I feel better. Uh, when I'm reading books, I get more confident. Uh, when I go to conferences and seminars and various things, it makes me more confident about my intelligence and my ability to perform better at work and do business better. You know, self-confident people, they, they typically will promote well in their jobs. Um, they are high achievers. They are better in relationships. When you're confident, that's the, it's the challenging thing to be in a relationship with someone who doesn't have self-confidence because they're going to put more on you in it. And so self-confident people, they do better in relationships. It's just, it, it's, it's an overall incredible and amazing thing to be self-confident. I know people who are at the top of their fields uh, in, in various disciplines, and they literally walk on water in their respective fields, and they, they just exemplify this self-confidence, and it's infectious, and it's awesome, and it's, and it's wonderful. And so being self-confident is awesome, and it is almost everything. And yet, God has a strategy for us to take us to an even greater level of confidence. Because one of the things that, that I've learned about self-confidence, and although it is an amazing thing, and I, and I encourage everyone to be self-confident, right? God wants you to be you know, confident in yourself. He wants you to be self-confident. He wants you to think uh, highly of yourself. But one of the things that I've learned is that uh, there is one problem in my self-confidence, one problem. And that one problem, my self-confidence, is me. If you're taking notes, take this thought down. The limitation of self-confidence is self. As wonderful as it is, it has a limitation. And the limitation is that if you are only self-confident, the buck stops with you, and you and I are limited, which means that our confidence will be limited and the problem with that is that oftentimes, if you're taking notes, write this down as well, oftentimes God promises us things that are beyond us. Are you tracking with me? And so if God promises us things that are beyond us, then in order for us to have the confidence to lay hold of those things, we're going to have to have a confidence that is beyond us. Are you tracking with me? Just turn to your neighbor and say, stay with him. He's going somewhere. Stay with him. Th this, was, this was Abram's d dilemma. His promise, watch this, his promise was bigger than his ability. H have you ever had God's promise to you, if you're honest, be bigger than the ability of you? See, self-confidence is awesome as long as you can do it. Hello, somebody? Like, like, like I, I, don't, I, I can't like, hoop really well. I, I'm, not, I'm not a phenomenal basketball player. I'll D you up, but that's about all I got for you, right? My release is terrible. I just, I don't, you know what I mean? So I'm not confident in that. So, so if you're like, yo, PT, man, let, let's go hoop, I'd be like, I, I'm, I'm hungry. <laughs> I, I'm going to go eat something, right? So, so, so the challenge is God calls us to things that are bigger than us, and if we are only self-confident, we're going to fall short. This is Abram's dilemma. His dilemma is he needs what I like to call Godfidence. He, he needs confidence that goes beyond his own ability, and you need confidence. If you're going to be everything that God has called you to be, and if you're going to achieve the things that God has called you to achieve, you're going to have to get beyond self-confidence, and God will bring you into another level of confidence so that you can be who he's called you to be, so that you can go where he's called you to go, and so that you can do what he's called you to do. Are you tracking with me? So God recognizing that he doesn't have, that he needs another level of confidence, God moves in and he does something about it. 
And the question is, what did God do about it? I'll tell you what he did. If you're taking notes, write this down. He establishes his covenant with Abraham. Now, he had made a covenant when God speaks something because God is infallible, because God cannot lie. That is his covenant. His word is his bond. But God knew that he needed to establish him. Remember, he asked the question, how shall I know that I will inherit the land? God knew that he had to take him to another level of confidence, and God knew exactly how to do it. He enters into, in fact, he establishes better a covenant with Abraham. Let's talk about it. Here's one thing that you need to understand. If you're taking notes, write this down. God establishes covenant to create confidence. Say it again. God establishes covenant to create confidence because God knows that in order to be great, you must be confident. He will not, watch this, he will not require that from you that he has not resourced in you. This is what I love about God. He will not ask you to be what he will not give you the strength to be. That's why when the disciples in the days of Jesus were struggling with belief, they said, God, I believe, help my unbelief, right? So th there are levels to believing, and you cannot have what you do not expect. I feel the Spirit of God in here right now. God knows that. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It says without faith, it is impossible to please God. He is not mad at you when you don't have faith. He just knows that you cannot produce if you do not have faith. And so God is always going to be channeling resources in your direction to develop your insides to be large enough to produce the outsides that God sees. If you understand that, Say, I'm tracking with you, PT. God's not going to leave you out there. Abram wasn't a weak man by asking God, how shall I know it? He was not a weak man. He was a human. We're human. And we need our confidence upgraded for the journey that God has in front of us. And God says, no problem. There's a passage of scripture that says that he who has begun a good work in you shall complete it. In other words, I'll give you the faith to start the business. I'll give you the faith to start the ministry. I'll give you a faith to reach the nations. I will give you the faith to do what I've called you to do. Oh, God, I feel it. I'll give you the faith. Hmm. I feel the Spirit of God. I'll give you the faith. Don't worry about it. Focus on what I said. I'll give you the faith to be who you need to be to accomplish what I've called you to. Wow. God always gives you a word that's bigger than how you feel. I'm trying to move on, but I can't quit. God, God, God will always call you to something that is bigger than the you that you are presently familiar with. And you have to allow what God says to you to tell you who you are. Uh, or else how would you ever know who you were? I feel the Spirit. Can I, can I teach you a little bit this morning? How would you ever know who you were and what your abilities were if God did not call you to lofty things that require you to stretch and become who he sees you as? God says, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. In other words, God knows a version of you that you haven't even met yet. You're still meeting you. I'm still meeting me. And one of the things that God uses to introduce me to me is a lofty thing that is bigger than me. Are we tracking? Can we go further? So God says, I've got a plan for it, no problem. I'm going to establish my covenant with you. So let's talk about what a covenant is. A covenant is a contract between two parties. 
And what we're going to see later on when we look at Hebrews chapter 6 is that, that these, this covenant contract, contract covenant, it ends strifes and disputes. So when I'm struggling with believing and coming into agreement and alignment with what God said, the covenant is introduced because it's going to end, watch this, the internal disputing that I have. See, when I'm not believing God, that means that on the inside, I am disputing what he said. All of us have an internal antagonist. <laughs> you, you don't even have to go outside. All of us within us has what I like to call, like I, we all have this, 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 this mad scientist on the inside of us that is always challenging and questioning what God says. So, so he creates covenant because he wants to shore us up and give a foundation to stand on by putting an end to disputes. Let me tell you something. I, I, I don't do business without a contract. And, and this is for something. This is, I'm going to give you something for free, business people. Always have the agreements. Always make the agreements when you're doing business with contractors or vendors or friends or whatever family, always get the business worked out while you're still friends. Because sometimes you're friends and you love each other and you got the, the vision together and you want to go into business together and you're like, oh, we would never have a dispute. So there's no reason that we need to get our paperwork together. We don't need to do that. We love each other. We will never. Child. When you throw some money in there, no, I love you, but I'm going to tell you what, while we are still amenable, let's get this deal down on paper because when I have the contract done, I feel peace because at the end of the day, I can say, you, you tripping, no, 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 go back to paragraph two in section C, line number three. Remember, this is already worked out. So God knowing, watch this, that covenant brings peace. God is a God who cannot lie. So God introduces covenant. But not just any old covenant. We're going to go deeper now. He introduces what is called a blood covenant. So, so Abram says... How shall I know it? God doesn't answer. God says, he doesn't answer, well, this is how, you, he doesn't try to convince him with words. God does something that will speak to him in the language of covenant and contract of that time, of that Near Eastern time, civilization. This is how it worked. When two people were entering into covenant together about a land, what they would do is they would do this thing called a blood sacrifice and they would take animals and they would split the animals in two, which would leave a path of blood. Mm -hmm. And both parties would walk between the pieces as a sign that, watch this, if they violated the oath of that covenant, they would die. That, that they would be literally, be it unto me as what happened to these animals. That's why you didn't break covenant back in them days. Because if you broke covenant, it wasn't just like, oh, you know, send me to collections. Oh, take me to court. Nah, you died. They were serious about covenant. So, so imagine that. Imagine Abram saying, how shall I know it? Watch this. To a God that he has not seen. It has only been up to this point a voice and a vision. But not a vision of God. The vision, vision, I wish I had time to teach this, but sometimes God will speak to you in a vision. He will show you things that mean something to you. So Abraham has not seen God yet. So imagine where Abram is when he is saying, how will I know it? How shall I know it? 
And then all of a sudden, God is speaking to him in blood covenant language. Oh, you got to catch this. He, 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 he says to him, hey, go, go, go get these animals. We're about to enter into a sacrifice. Abraham is probably like, wait, I understand the concept, but I have never seen you and your spirit. So how is this? Can you imagine how perplexed he must have been? He's probably like, wait, I think that God is trying to enter into a blood covenant with me, but I've never seen him. It's only been a voice. It's only been vision. And like a blood covenant, like, wait, wait a minute. See, see, one of the things you have to understand about God is God will meet you where you are. I love that. He, he, will, he, he is so adamant about getting you to where you need to be. He will do things in your language to get you to where you need to go. So, so, so he says, he tells him, he says, go ahead and, 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 and set up this, this blood covenant. This, 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 this arrangement of the divided animal carcasses would have, would have been, Abraham would have instantly recognized that this was a setup for making the blood covenant. The blood covenant was, was the seal of promises made. And, and there are two interesting observations about this point. And you see it in the text. In fact, let, 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 let's go there real quick. Let, let's, go, let's go back to, to Genesis. I want, I want to look at this blood covenant thing. It says in, in verse 9, he says, So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And then he brought all these to him and he cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And, you know, he shooed away the vultures. And then verse 17, it says, and it came to pass, watch this, when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. And on the same day, the Lord made a covenant. Two things. First of all, the first thing that happened is this. You remember the covenant the blood covenant required that, that the parties involved pass between the two pieces where the blood was. You remember that, right? The flame, our God is a consuming fire, passing in between the pieces was God himself entering into covenant. See, in order to really understand this, you got to put yourself in the mindset and the mentality of Abram at that time. These contracts were made by both parties walking between the pieces. So when the flame of fire passes between the two pieces, it is God himself. Saying, I'm in this thing. And the other thing that is interesting about this is that Abraham doesn't pass through the pieces because he's just waking up. He had fallen asleep. If you read that whole thing, he had fallen asleep. And God spoke to him in a dream and asleep. And next thing you know, he would wake up out of this thing. And this happens. There is never any indication that Abram walked through, which means my second point is God alone passed between the pieces. So the covenant, this blood covenant, was sealed by God alone, which means that nothing depended upon Abraham. Everything depended on God to be promised, and it was a foreshadowing of the reality of Christ. How many of us know we didn't do anything to get the grace that we... Come on, somebody. It's by grace that we are saved through faith. We didn't do anything. 
This had nothing to do with us. Watch this. God doesn't need us in order to be good to us. Are you tracking with me? He is just good. How does Abraham get to the point that he believes God so perfectly that he is willing to offer up his son at the bequest of God, the request of God. How is he able? Who do you have to be? You ever wonder? Let's just keep it 200 in here. There's some of you, and you read that thing in Genesis chapter 22, where God says, bring up your son and offer him on, on Moriah. And some of you are like, Tuh. I know you're good. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I agree with your good, all, that you're good and all that kind of stuff. I understand that. But let me tell you something. That, that's going to be rough for me. Can we just be honest with you? None of you love that passage. You love it for Abram. You do not love it for you. Mm -hmm. So how does Abram get to this place where he is absolutely convinced and so convinced that he would sacrifice anything, even the thing that he wanted the most. It's because of that blood covenant. He knew that God could not lie. And if God told him that he was going to have a multitude of sons, if he was asking for that son, that meant he was going to multiply. He, that son was going to be raised from the dead. That also was a foreshadowing of Christ. And there's some people in here right now, and you will never see the harvest in your life until you're willing to take God at his word and believe him like Abraham believed him. God has walked between the pieces because he couldn't swear by any greater. He swore by himself. Let me show you something. We're almost done. Let me show you something. You're going to catch this today. Good God Almighty. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 6. Verse 13, Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 13 explains this. It says, for when God made a promise to Abram, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. They, you know, they, they have this, this saying, you know, in, in, in the inner city called, you know, and, and the saying be like, I, I, I put that on me. Or I, I put that on. And then you would name what you put that on. And so when you were trying to convince somebody that you were, you're not lying and you were telling the truth, some of you know what I'm talking about. You look all sophisticated. I don't know what you're talking about. I know nothing about the inner city. You know what I'm talking about. And when they wanted to convince you that they were telling the truth, they'd be like, yo, dude, I put that on this. And, you know, and some of you, I put that on my mom. And, like, you know, and you love your mom and you should love your mom. But, you know, I put that on this. And sometimes, you know, I put that on me, on me, on, on, you know, or whatever, right? And so God is in that same thing. Because he couldn't swear by any greater, he swears by himself. In other words, I put that on me, says God. If I don't do what I promised to do to you, then I'm going to die. And since I cannot die, since I am eternal and everlasting, baby, since I cannot swear by any greater, I'm swearing by myself. If you know you serve a God who cannot lie, Give him a shout of glory in this house. God says, I can't swear by any greater. There's nothing greater than me. If I promise it to you, it is coming to pass. You can take it to the bank right now. On me, says God. On me. How shall I know it? On me. On me. I'm going to heal your body. On me, I'm going to give you financial breakthrough. On me, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. On me, says God. On me, your children will be saved. On me, that spouse is waiting for you. On me, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. On me, I'm going to come through for you. On me. On me. I put that on me, says God. On me. On me. 
Jesus going to the cross was God saying, on me. I got you. Your sins, on me. Your weakness, on me. Your limitations, on me. Your struggles, on me. On me, this will come to pass in your life. On me, baby. On me. On me, LA. On me, online. On me. I hear God saying, you're asking God, how will I know it's going to happen? And God is saying, because I put it on me. And my word is solid. I'm not like one of your friends. I love your mama, says God, but I ain't like your mama. For when God made a promise to Abram, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, surely I will bless you and, and multiplying, I will multiply you. And it says, and so after Abram had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Now, I want to jump down to verse 19. And I want to close here. It says, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul. We're talking about covenant. We're talking about God swearing by himself because he could not swear by any greater. The covenant itself was strength. So to make an oath already is strength. But then it's the one who made the oath. If you keep reading in there, in verse 18, it talks about two immutable things. Two immutable things. One, the, the, an oath, a contract is immutable. And God is immutable. Because in verse 18 it says it's impossible for God to lie. That, watch this, this is important, I'm almost done. It says that we might have strong consolation. Remember, covenant is to bring you to confidence. Not self-confidence, but a confidence that transcends that, right? It says, it says, this, we, we, he, he did this so that we might have strong consolation. There's somebody in here right now, and you need strong consolation about what God has spoken to you. And it says, who have fled for refuge, refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. The context, obviously, is the Jews were really, really persecuted for following Jesus. But there's some of you, and you, oh, I feel this prophetically, and you have left circumstances and situations because God said better is outside of those things. And, and the only challenge is you have come out of that, but you haven't come into what you expected you would come into. Who in the word of my prophesying, prophesying to? Maybe, maybe you gave your life to God and you expect it for things to instantaneously and automatically be different. You walked away from some things, some people, some ways. And, 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 and now you need to be consoled because you, 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 you haven't seen yet the fullness of what he promised. And here you are, maybe like Abram, I left Ur of the Chaldeans where my, my father was set up and you know, it may not have been everything that I wanted it to be, but at least I knew it. And God says, let me tell you something, I did call, I feel that for somebody, I did call you out of Ur, I feel that. I, I did call you out of that place. I did call you out of that situation. I did call you to leave the familiar, to leave the, the, uh, the comfortable. And now you're uncomfortable and you need consolation. How do you get consolation? You get consolation by covenant. When God, that's why you're hearing this message today. When God wants to encourage you, watch this, and to anchor you, he does not immediately do what he promises, what he promised, because that, that, that doesn't, you're not developed in that. You're developed in the window between promise and manifestation. That window in between, that space in between is the place where you are developed. But what gives you the strength and the fortitude to continue on 
It's covenant. And it says, this covenant, last point, this covenant, it says, if we go to verse 19, this hope, this, the hope that's created by this covenant, this confidence that is created by the covenant of God, it says, is an anchor to the soul. <laughs> confidence is powerful. I looked up that word confidence, and the word confidence is from the Latin word confident, and it means having full trust. It's from the verb confidere, and that's two words, con, watch this, expresses intensive force. And the other word is fidere, which means trust. So the word confident means powerful trust. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. The reason why God is trying to get you to trust is because trust is powerful. I'm not talking about self-confidence. It is powerful. That's fine. But this is something different. This is trust that will move mountains. That's why he said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will speak to the mountain and say, be thou removed and cast into the sea. What he's saying is, it doesn't, you can't do it with mustard seed faith, but you have the elements that all you have to do is grow it and it's powerful. So my powerful trust and this powerful trust is an anchor of the soul. What is the soul? The soul has to do with your mind, it has to do with emotions, it has to do with, with memories. So, 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 so we're talking about an anchor. What is it? An anchor creates stability. I feel the Holy Ghost. If, if, you're, if you're taking notes, write this last note down. Confidence is an anchor for the emotions because your emotions will cause you to be out of position and consequently miss what God is doing. And so, so it says it's an anchor for the soul. It's an anchor for your emotion. And here's what I've learned. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I've learned that if I can get my emotions anchored, I can do anything. If I can get my emotions grounded so that my emotions are not driving my destiny vehicle, I can do anything because I've got the promise on God. I've got the promise. But what keeps me vacillating back and forth and quite frankly, emotions are if you're not careful, subject to change your behavior. Oh, God, I'm trying to stop, I'm trying to stop, but I, emotions want to take over. That's why, you know, you start off being a little angry, next year you know, you're real angry. And now you're doing something. But if you can have your emotions anchored, you can do anything. I want to pray for you. Confidence, true confidence, is a gift. Come on, stand with me. L.A., I want you to stand. Stand with me. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. God, God wants to gift you with real confidence today. Self-confidence is wonderful. I've got plenty of it but it's limited. God wants to give you something more. See, see self-confidence will only work in the areas of my proficiency, but there's a lot in this world that is outside of what I'm good at. And there are a lot of things that God has promised me. There are a lot of things that God 
has called me to. Huh? How about that? That are outside of my current expertise and experience. And if I'm only, only self-confident, I can't be everything that God has called me to be. God doesn't leave you there. He says, you know what? I got you covered. I got you covered. As you wrestle with the question, how shall I know? God says, I'm going to make you know. Because I'm going to make known to you who I am. I'm going to speak to you in your own language. For Abraham, it was the blood covenant. And obviously, theologically, that had enormous, enormous significance. But he will meet you right where you are. And he will pass between whatever pieces you have and make his covenant known. You're going to need confidence. I'm not, this is a series, by the way. You're going to need this type of confidence as we step into this decade because there's so many things happening in our world that if you're not careful, you will, you will get emotional and you will be shaken off course. Are you tracking with me? So if you hear it and you say, Pastor, I believe that, that you were speaking to me in this message and, and God, I, I, want, I want that type of confidence that you are describing. Self-confidence is wonderful. That's great. See, here's an awesome thing about God confidence. Self-confidence comes with God confidence. But God confidence doesn't come with self-confidence. It is a two for one in one way. In another way, there's no guarantee. See, the shift happened. Abram went from self-confidence to next level confidence when he opened himself to covenant with God. If that's you, I want you to come meet me here at this altar today. You say, you know what, Pastor? I want, I want, I want another level of confidence. Self-confidence is wonderful, but I need God confidence. That's you. I want you to meet me here. I see you come in LA. I see you come in Denver. Come on, we're about to get this thing. God's going to gift Oramashiba. God's going to gift you. He's going to gift you with a new dimension of confidence. And you need it. You need it. I was at the place that I was staying on Friday. I got into town late that night. And I was confronted by, I was downtown. And I was confronted by a guy. And I believe he was demonized. And I typically travel, move about with a, a, an additional person to watch me, but before I knew it, this dude was up on me. And I didn't know, you know, he was, I didn't know if he was strapped, or, well, that means, in case you didn't, strap means packing. <laughs> packing means had something on him. Just, I got, you know, I don't know if he was strapped. And I could just tell he had something going on. And I, and, and, and I, he, I just turned, and he was right there within feet of me and kind of just talking crazy or whatever, and he had a little size on him. And I had confidence. Uh, but both of my confidence were working <laughs> because I was praying in the spirit, but he was about to be the, the first beneficiary of my crowd, my God training. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I, he, however, I, I don't want it to happen that way. I had two confidences working. If the angels are moving a little slow, come on, somebody. One or two knee strikes will get it done. I'm sorry. That was so unspiritual. But no, in, in that moment, the Holy Spirit came over me. And I just began to pray in tongues. I began to speak in tongues. It's right there. Because I'm not, we're not going to have a conversation. You're, something's going on with you. And I just started praying in tongues. I started praying. Confidence. God confidence. I started praying in tongues right there. Under my breath. Wasn't loud. Wasn't crazy. Just under my breath. Just looking at him. My shit out of there. And, you know, and just praying in tongues. And he bowed down to me physically. 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 He bowed down and he did this. Uh, I don't know if you've ever watched Planet of the Apes where as a sign of submission, the ape gets low, bows down, and he puts his hand up. He literally did that. And I said, I'll take that. 
I'll take that as this conflict, and it was over. But what I'm talking about is, family, we're moving into a time where you have to have God for this. <laughs> David said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid when the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh? They stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this I will be confident. And that's what God wants to give you. If you're not at this altar, get to this altar. We're going to pray for you and you're going to get confident in my shida. You don't have to be worried. We got a lot going on in our world right now, but one thing I am not is scared. I feel the Holy Spirit of God. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I don't care if the earth shakes. I don't care if the mountains are rolled up. God is for me and if God is for me, who can be against me? can be against me. So the church is going to model Godfidence. And that is going to make your light shine when people are afraid, wondering when the next thing is going to go off. Hello, somebody. Can I talk to you real for a second? You're going to say, you know what? A thousand might fall at my side and 10,000 by my right side. But it shall not come near me. That's Psalm 91, in case you didn't know. If you're here and you don't know the Lord, now's about time to get into covenant. If that's you and you're here and you say, hey, listen, look, look, look at how this went. Abraham had a relationship with God without religion. This all predated the law. Watch this. God spoke to him. Remember the three ways that God revealed himself? He spoke to him. Boom. Your relationship with God will give you the ability to perceive and to accurately discern the voice of God. Then he communicated to him in a vision. And then he manifests himself through fire. What am I saying? Whatever it takes to get you to perceive God, he will use. So if you're here and you say, I want to know God like Abram knew God, I want you to come and meet me here at this altar as well. You're going to know him. He's going to speak to you. He's going to lead you. He's going to empower you. And he's going to give you everything you need. If that's you, I want you to come and meet me here at this altar. L.A., come on, you can come. Come on, come on. If you're watching via live stream, I want you to get as close to your phone, as close to your computer screen. I'm going to pray for you. I want you to just lift your hands like you're getting ready to receive something. Father, we thank you so much for this atmosphere. This atmosphere of truth. This atmosphere of glory. This atmosphere of your presence and your power will never be the same. We're changed, God, in this atmosphere. God, I thank you for every person here. You're, you love them. You're committed to them. You're for them, God. Hallelujah. You don't want from them, you're for them. And you know exactly what they need. God, you told me to start talking to your sons and daughters about confidence, about Godfidence type of confidence. And Father, I thank you today, God, that something that's been imparted. I thank you, God, for those who are wrestling and questioning and saying, God, how shall I know you're gonna do what you say you're gonna do? How? do I know that I haven't washed my hands in vain? How, how shall I know that, that you haven't brought me out to leave me stranded? And God, I thank you that you're answering by covenant. You said faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and your, your word has been declared and therefore confidence is rising. Impart covenant confidence here today. I want you to repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I receive it. I thank you for your love. I embrace it. 
I thank you for covenant. I receive that. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for making him who had no sin, all of mine, all of my limitations, all of my weaknesses, all of my shortcomings. You placed in his body, nailed it to the cross, and put it to death. And just as he was raised up, you're raising me up from level to level, from strength to strength. And today, I receive the gift of divine confidence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's praise the Lord in here today. Come on, let's praise the Lord in here today.